Welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. This is a space where we seek to create and cultivate healthy conversations between those things we geek out on and the philosophical and theological questions that often arise out of our fandoms. Like, what does it mean to be human? What makes a hero? What makes a villain? How do the stories and narratives we geek out on shape how we live in the world? We are your priest to the geeks. We aren't all ordained, but we see ourselves as mediators at the intersection of geek culture and going deeper in our faith. We don't always have to agree, but we do respect each other, and we see everyone as a beloved child of God. Everyone geeks out on something, so come geek out with us and enjoy the show. You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Hello, Geekologists. Welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. Here we go. Because you demanded it, the episode we've all been waiting for. We're probably the first podcast to ever talk about this subject. Uh, it's a first time for, for someone to solve the question that's on everybody's mind. We're going to have the final answer once and for all. Which is better, Star Wars or Star Trek. One has to win, one has to lose. There's a right answer, right? They have to compete each other. That's what geek culture is telling us out there in the world. All the clickbait stuff says that it has to be a final answer. There has to be a winner. There has to be a loser. And so we're going to solve that today. And well, friends, if that sounds a little off brand for systematic ecology, you're right. You're right. That is not the kind of episode that we're going to do today. Happy May the 4th be with you in the spirit of May the 4th be with you. Uh, we are going to have a conversation, uh, a part of our Versus series, comparing two franchises and where they're similar uh, where they're different, why, if there is any tension between the two, uh, why that tension is there, why people say that we have to compete against one another. Uh, that's the kind of conversation we're going to have today to model for you how to have a healthy conversation around these things that we geek out on. And so I couldn't do this alone. I couldn't do this episode alone. So we're bringing on board Yes, one of our new official hosts of Systematic Ecology, Matthew Winter. Matthew, welcome to the show. Uh, we've chatted before uh, online and have intersecting Venn diagrams of our fandoms, but here we are, the first time ever. This yeah. is a historic episode when Matthew and yeah. Will come together and solve the problem of Star Wars and Star Trek. <laughs> if there is a problem, welcome Thank to the you. show, Matthew. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah, there we go. So uh, glad you're here. Glad we can do this. Um, yeah, we'll share more about what our kind of history is with uh, Star Wars and Star Trek and, and why we're having this conversation today. Um, but first off, uh, what are we geeking out on today? Matthew, what are you geeking oh, out gosh. on? Gosh, um, read the book right now. Man, it is a, it is a, it is a slow trod because it is, there's a lot to it. Um, but, uh, reaching out, uh, by now okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Henry yep. now. So I'm just, yeah, I'm starting that. Um, it's, it's related to a class I'm doing at church and, uh, it's good. Um, um, other stuff. Nice. Um, I just, I just started playing, um, Xenoverse again, cause there's some new DLC coming. So I'm. Getting used to playing that again for the new DLC. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I like it that we have um, like a wide range of hosts here at Systematic. There's a reason why we don't have just two or three hosts. We have our goal is like 14 because we know that uh, the breadth and depth of fandom and geekdom, what people geek it down from from books and rich theology to to games, board games, video games and and the MCU, all that stuff is, is there. So that's what we try to do here at Systematic Ecology. And so, so yeah, if there's something you haven't heard us discuss or talk about out there, friends, uh, let us know, reach out, send us a message, say, have you seen this? We're always looking for recommendations and things to geek out on. Um, what I'm geeking out on, it is, uh, 
it's a good time to be an uh, X-Men fan because of uh, the cartoons and the comics that are coming up. But it's also like that like apocalyptic geekdom genre just isn't going away. It's always going to be around. And I'm not going to say Fallout. I'm late to the game on a show called Station Eleven. Matthew, have you heard of Station Eleven? I don't 11? think so. Yeah, I didn't either until a friend said, hey, um, you should watch the show. And it's on it's on Max. It's a 10 episode limited series. Uh, there's not going to be a season two. It's a couple years old and it is apocalyptic huh. realism. And actually, my daughter was reading the book and um, she told me she was reading the book and said it was really good. And I kind of forgot about it. And then when someone mentioned this show, it is such a good show. I we did the finale last night. It is beautifully directed and shot and the story oh it is so good so here's the deal there's a a, a flu pandemic that wipes out 99 percent of the world and uh um and so 20 years later they flash forward flash back what is the world like 20 af 20 years after like everything goes to hell in a handbasket literally and so um but the thing about this book is that it was written before covid like years before covid like eight 10 years before COVID maybe. And then they were filming the show and they were halfway through with it when COVID broke out. And so, so they had to shut this down because of a global pandemic about a show about a global <laughs> pandemic. And, and it, I can imagine what the actors and actresses who are filming this and read the script were like, what is happening? We're literally living what is going on. There's unknown days of COVID, but it's, it's a little trigger, triggering if COVID was hard for you and you're seeing people walking masks and the fear of death and, and what are we going to do next kind of thing. Um, but, but man, beautiful in how it tells its story. It is geek adjacent because not only apocalyptic literature, but also because uh, the underlying story is like this person writing a graphic novel that becomes like um, almost like a sacred text mm. in this world uh, for people in it. So amazing show. Can't recommend enough. I know we're still going to be quick about this, but I can't. <laughs> uh, Station 11. It's just after last night, man, I was just like, man, that is that is good stuff. So uh, that's what we're geeking out on. Let's get into <laughs> let us get into the topic of the day. Star Wars. Star Trek, uh, two of the most popular franchises that are out there, the best in the sci-fi game. They both have the most loyal and uh, passionate fans, but also they have uh, a part of it, um, a lot of fan backlash and a lot of toxic fandom around these franchises as well. And we're not going to solve all those problems today, uh, but we're going to give a little bit of kind of our history behind it and kind of the nuance behind these two franchises, how they're similar, how they're different and, and how we can, we can handle those things. So uh, Matthew, I'll, I'll start with you. What, what's some of your history with both of these franchises? I know you kind of lean more into Star Trek if I'm, if I'm right, but like, what is your history with them and, and where do you stand yeah. right now? With these yeah. As an adult, that's true. But, um, you know, definitely yeah. um, like I can't think of a time in my life without either one of these these IPs. So, I, I <laughs> yeah. mean, they they uh -huh. go all the way back to just, you know, mad as a wee little lad. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Gosh, I mean, you know, as a uh, – as a kid, this was definitely much more of a toss up for me. I mean, I had, yeah, I had all of the novelizations of the movies. Um, I had, um, I don't even, I don't remember what it was called because it was so long ago. But um, my mom had signed me up for some kind of like through the mail Star Wars RPG thing. So I was reading a book and I would have character cards and all this stuff and go through and do missions and all oh. that. So, um, yeah, I had technical manuals and all that stuff. Um, so I I am no stranger to uh, to Star Wars, but um, I don't know. As I got older and matured and actually lived life a little bit, I began to appreciate mm -hmm. more of what Star Trek brings to the table um which which i really yeah. think that's the basis of this whole uh this whole conversation i mean at, as yeah. a kid you know the force and lightsabers and all that are the coolest friggin thing in the whole world but <laughs> as, uh, uh yeah. you know as i grew up and hopefully matured um, you know, the uh, the votes out on that but uh, <laughs> i uh i grew to like star trek better just because it does it does more for me on a personal level yeah nice um what would you say like star trek right now kind of what's what's out there in terms of um 
some storylines or, or shows or movies that you're like, yeah, I just listened to the the Earth Day uh, Star Trek <laughs> four episode that you guys did. I loved it. Yeah. I went back. I, I remember seeing that in the theater when I was younger. And but then, um, you know, going back and watching uh, at least the first half, mm-hmm. I need to finish mm-hmm. it. But man, I was like, golly, this is so goofy and fun and good. Um, but but yeah, like, are, are there a certain part now that you're like, yep, this is what really gets me up to to watch oh, or get into this um, certain. I mean, right, right now I'm kind of on a Trek hiatus. Um, I'm very, um, I'm very cyclical and very obsessive with how I do things. So, um, like I'll, I'll get into something and it's just full bore all the time that thing until I'm sick of it. And then I move on to my next and I'm just not, I'm not in the Star Trek part of the cycle right now. Um, right, right. Yeah. There's seasons. Yeah, but there are I, definitely seasons. I am so looking fan. forward to. Um, I haven't watched tons of Strange New Worlds yet, although I absolutely love what I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, you know, binge culture has kind of ruined ruined a lot of that stuff, and I want to yeah. wait until there's more, mm-hmm. and then I can just I yeah. can watch all of it. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, what I've, I've shared here at Systematic Ecology before that my top fan of my avatar is uh, is, is Luke Skywalker with a green lightsaber as a Jedi. But um, that I like you, I, I I relate to the story that is always it feels like has always been a part of of my life because the first movie I saw in the theater was A New Hope mm. when I was five years old. Um, that at the end of that summer, you know, and so from there as a five year old, getting all the toys and and having my imagination sparked with this sci-fi fantasy, high fantasy, spirituality, good versus right. evil, superheroes, all that thing was a part of my early childhood. And then leading up to Empire Strikes Back as an eight-year-old, it just could not have hit me in a better spot in terms of what all of us in the neighborhood and, cl- and classmates loved and talked about and and pretended to be uh, when we were kids. And then you had Return of the Jedi, which put, you know, kind of uh, sealed up the story and, and did those kinds of things. Um, and so then, then you know, of course, Star Wars, uh, watching the movies on the VHS or when they came on HBO or whatever. And, ha- and then then the, the novelization of the extended mm-hmm. universe and those things came out. And then I hit Teenage Land. And I was like, yeah, I love Star Wars, but, you know, I'm not going to lean super hard into like, following every single book that comes out or that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of a hiatus there. But then when the prequels came out, we're like, yeah, let's jump back in. And of course, as an OG fan, I was kind of like, man, I really wrestled with the prequels <laughs> and what they were doing, what George Lucas was doing. And I was a, I was a part of that that fan backlash of like, if I would have written this, I would have done it this way. Why do you do it this way, <laughs> right. George? You know, I know better than you. Um so I was a part of that, and then, and then a little later on, I, to be to be honest, like I was excited that Disney acquired the the IP because I was like, that means more Star Wars. You know, I was a little frustrated with George Lucas and what he had done, or and I understand why he stopped making Star Wars because of toxic fandom, and I thought it was kind of dead. And and okay, but then here comes Disney to kind of resurrect it to bring it back, uh, and then here comes the fans again. And we're like, if I was writing, this is what I would write for my thing again. That same echo of of, of fans doing that, but. But Star Wars has always been a part. And I remember as a kid, Star Trek, you know, I was way into uh, anything sci-fi mm-hmm. I could get my my hands on. I loved it. Uh, the original Battlestar Galactica on TV, you know, complete ripoff of Star Wars for the TV. Where I loved it. Uh, v, Buck Rogers, all that stuff on TV. I was like, yeah, let me get a part of it. And then when Star Trek came on, I was like, what? why are they talking so much? <laughs> uh, why are there blasters on on like stun or phase, you know, what, what is this? Why aren't there more lasers and action and dog fights in space? Um, and then, and then later on where my was like, Oh, Star Trek is, is this is what it's trying to do with that franchise uh, as opposed to like Star Wars, high fantasy, faster, more intense was George Lucas thing. I think Star Trek, the original tent was let's be thoughtful. Uh, I don't think maybe the stereotypes there, but like Twilight Zone in space, let's, let's have a, a more in-depth conversation around nuance of like life and progressivism and futurism and what uh, humans could be like in the future and how we can handle our problems. Star Wars was more like the space opera fantasy kind of thing. So I I, I noticed that as a kid and lean more into Star Wars, but as I get older, like you uh, matured, I'm a different person now than I was five, 10 years ago. So I, I definitely appreciate Star Trek. And then for me, I will also say 
JJ JJ Abrams reboots of the movie when he did the the Star Trek reboot in 2009 I loved it because JJ Abrams is a Star Wars fan he wanted to make Star Trek more like Star Wars and I understand original like fans of Star Trek why they're frustrated with JJ Abrams but for me I was like yeah you're leaning right into my faster more intense <laughs> kind of thing um uh but I understand the criticism behind those those things as well so that's kind of our you know, history behind and where we're coming from. Um, yeah, as you said, there's so much streaming. There's so much content. I wish I had more time to yeah. go deeper into Star Trek stuff that's out there. But with my fandom, I, you know, anything Star Wars comes up, I'm going to watch it the day it comes out kind of thing. And then maybe I'll get to Star Trek one day. I don't know when that one day is going to be, but maybe one day I'll do more of those yeah, kinds of things. That's where I was at with um, kind of prepping for this is – I went through and I watched um, I watched Solo and I'm in Clone Wars right now and I'm watching some of the Star Wars stuff nice. I haven't seen, um, you know, which just reminded me how much I absolutely still do love Star Wars because it is awesome and it's, yeah. you know, it's just as much a part of my DNA as Star Trek is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. Now, now, both of us would say out there, friends who are listening or hanging out and watching us on YouTube, that we'll, we'll confess that like Star Wars, Star Trek's not like the original sci-fi. There is a lot that oh, came yeah. before it. They didn't invent nope. sci-fi. Uh, I was going back and reading and prep for this a little bit like, what was the first sci-fi? And and some people say like uh, Mary Shealy's like Frankenstein in the 1800s was the first sci-fi speculative fiction monster uh, kind of geeky sure. genre. You know, I, I know there's the debate the out there about that, but I think that's kind of neat that, to think about going way back to the 1800s. I think all people always look to the stars and wondered what's behind it. It, what could we be? Uh, um, speculative fiction's always been a part of, of human nature and storytelling. Uh, but but there's, you know, again, like the pulp writing of the early 1900s of um, John Carter of Mars. And then you had Flash right. Gordon. You had Buck Rogers. Uh, you had all those things. Then you, then you had... Um, you know, Dune come out in, in the 60s as as a, a novel and, and sci-fi. And then you had the Space Odyssey, uh, 2001 right. Space Odyssey in, in the yeah. late 60s. And I think that sci-fi was popular. And then uh, Star Trek debuted. Um, when, was, when did Star Trek 66. debut? It was 1966. Yeah. Yeah. 66. Yeah. Um, in September. So it was only had a few mm -hmm. seasons. Um, and then, and then it had kind of a second breath when they started making the movies right. again and, and leaning into the next generation. But, but yeah, it predates star Wars, but, and, and George Lucas, uh, he, he really wanted to do a flash Gordon, uh, film and he couldn't get the uh, rights. Uh, so he says, you know what, I'm going to do my own flash Gordon and write my own movie and do right. it myself and make it more fast and more intense. You know, from the get go of the opening scene of a new hope, boo, that big shit and lasers firing and we're going to go um uh full steam ahead in in the storyline um so so star wars um up the game when it came to like um franchises and pop culture and faster more intense but sci-fi um has always kind of been there in the last hundred years or more uh when it comes to capturing the human imagination and thinking about um science and who people can be and and that kind of thing so uh anything else to add there in the gaps of just acknowledging oh. that there are there are franchises that have oh, come gosh. before Star Wars um, and Star i Trek. think uh yeah. you know <laughs> you atomic era sci-fi um you know you can't um you can't not we can't not talk about asimov yeah um, you yep. know he's yep. right in there Re really helped define the genre and um, his mm -hmm. definitions are part of actually what I was using when we came up with this outline. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So acknowledging those who've come before, we're all building, we're all playing off each other's stories and ideas and building off off those kinds of things. And I think we have to acknowledge that's that's kind of where you know if you're going to pit these two against each other, you have to acknowledge what came before it, but also how they played off each other, borrowed from each other, uh, mimicked each other, copied each other, those kinds of things too, I think is a part of, of this conversation um, when it comes to that. Um, so, so Matthew, why in the world do we have to, or that people set up Star Wars and Star Trek against each other or the versus aspect of, of this conversation? Um, I think, I think influence um, you know, we just talked about, you know, there was so much sci-fi and stuff that was out before, but like sci-fi was never the meta. 
It was ne- it was mm. never something that was this super culturally influential thing. Uh, and I think a Star Trek came along. It didn't do that right away. Um, Star that- Wars came along and instantly just changed everything um, as far as cinematic mm-hmm. uh, sci-fi. Um, and then through that, though, and then through through the movies and then some of the uh, newer Trek spinoffs or I should well, I can't say new. There's newer stuff, but but the second gen of Star Trek, there, um, Next yeah. Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, um, uh, you know, it became just as culturally significant and part of the meta as Star Wars. Um, and I think that, and just the nature of the fandom and how passionate we are, are the two. Um, you know, you're. You're not going to have someone getting up on their roof, you know, shouting, um, you know, at the stars dressed up like a Cylon. It's just not, um, you, you know, right. like other other fandom just don't have the intensity of Star Trek and Star Wars. Um, so so yeah. I think it has to do with just the meta influence on the culture as a whole of these yeah. two franchises. Um, and just the passion and or toxicity of 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 the fan bases um, really kind of make them where they're a similar cultural phenomenon, at least. So- yeah, that, well, well said. I, I like what you said there about, um, you know, the, the the game changer of of Star Wars and kind of ramping up to that. If it wasn't George Lucas, it was going to be something. Something was going to do that, you know, because I think we're primed and ready for for one of these Ben Grand, grand narratives and, and kind of where where movies and storytelling and narratives when it comes to the the big popcorn flick and what's gathering people into uh, the theaters and that kind of thing. I think I, I actually judge time. You know, of course I judge time by the year of our Lord, uh, you know, and those kind of things and dates. But when I think of like pop culture, when I think of, of like years, I, before 1977 <laughs> and after 1977, like I, I like, Oh, that was a movie. That's a story that happened. Oh, that's before George Lucas came on the scene and, and started telling star Wars. Cause I do think there was a different way you told stories or way you did things before and after Star Wars, how you created movies to get people in the theater. And both these franchises have been commodified and franchised and, and let's make some money off of it. And they, and different times and, and places and ways that has kind of eaten its own tail or tried to promote its own self or make money and um, the money making machines. And, and they know that um, the fans and, and those who are critics of it. So I think, how do we keep this, these monsters going and how do we keep the monster fed as it moves forward too is, is part of that rather than just telling good stories, um, I think is a part of that. But, uh, but yeah, that's how I judge time. And I think. Did you know Systematic Ecology has a YouTube channel? Now you do. And while you're there, you can see exclusive stuff like our comic book catch-up series, Manga Mustard, Drinks with Tejas, the companion series to our annual theme. You can go Friday Night Frights with me where I go through cryptozoology, ufology, and more. You can also go to see Spidey Swing Buys where I'm doing every chronological appearance by release of Spider-Man from Amazing Fantasy 15 all the way to the modern age. You can also find exclusive shorts on YouTube there uh, as well as other bonuses for extra episodes that we do that don't end up on the podcast proper. So I want to see you over there on YouTube. I wonder your thoughts on this. Like I was thinking about this last night. It's like what what part of this rivalry comes from the outside of it and the inside? And the reason the outside of it are, are is that people looking down in the early days, was it people looking down on geeks when we weren't as popular uh, and the mainstay? Were people looking down on geeks and go, oh, look, you guys are all the same. The Trekkies and Star Wars, ha ha, picking fun and bullying them. Uh, and then within the inside, you have the two like, no, I'm not like them. I'm this way. I'm that way. I'm a Trekkie because I'm smart and thoughtful. And then the Star Wars, like, I'm a Star Wars guy because I, I like saving princesses <laughs> in space and I like lightsabers and I like action you uh, you boring friend you know so one of those stereotypes are kind of fanned into flame by by others from the outside just because it was cool back in the uh 80s to to pick on geeks and nerds um i think that's actually probably very very true um because i don't think Mm. um internally at least within the content i don't think there's any kind of you know deliberate um reference to each other at all within uh, right. within the material 
I mean, they're very much deliberately their own things, not even trying to do the same thing, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, but yeah, uh, absolutely from onlookers from the outside who aren't aware of the material, you know, it's all just, you know, <laughs> it, uh, I had a friend, um, in high school and, uh, she called it all Starland. Like it, it, it yeah. all just ex- okay. like it all just existed and whatever. And uh, whether you were into <laughs> Star Trek, Star Wars, Stargate, whatever, you were part of Starland in her, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know. So if you don't, uh, if you're not part of it and you don't get it, I can see why we all just look like crazy, obsessed weirdos who were part of Starland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and then, and I do think about kind of the tribalism in our in our culture mm-hmm. when it comes to like politics and religion and that kind of thing. You define yourself against someone who's uh, you're not, you know, because uh, I'm I'm a lifelong Lutheran, I'm a Lutheran pastor. Mm-hmm. A, a big part of my life and upbringing is like, well, what's a Lutheran? Well, we're not right. Catholic. And it was like, wait, wait, that doesn't quite make because if you go into our worship services, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> there's a lot of people wearing robes, and there's a lot of liturgy, yeah. and there's a lot of peace be with you, and also with you kind of thing going on Why, what do you mean we're not what, what does that mean so you dig into kind of where you are different where you are the same the common ground that that kind of thing so i i think um i i think you know yeah it's from the outside people looking in but also from the inside too there's a rival there's something about our nature that wants to pit ourselves against other or huddle into our own groups mm-hmm. and in group and if they're going to pick on me from the outside i'm going to be safe with my own tribe this way and it, it happens in fandom and yeah. so i think that was kind of natural for star trek and star wars to do and then as as geek culture grew and became a, a mainstay when it comes i mean you had that with marvel and dc yeah. you know they were copying each other i'm not dc i'm not i'm not thor is not superman but superman is not thor but guess what guess who's the headliner and Avengers number one back in the 1960s, Thor, you know, not Captain America, Thor, because they needed like a Superman guy for right. the like, for Avengers. But there's a reason why they're doing that. And I and I do think sometimes a rising tide lifts all boats, but then also it can become toxic about who's better, who's worse, and, and that kind of thing. And so I think I think that's part of why we're having this conversation here around uh these this holiday we call May 4th and and free comic book day and and acknowledging here comes summer with the summer blockbuster and, and that kind of stuff to kind of go ahead and put it out there. And I love that within our own host team, we have both Star Wars and Star Trek fans and we can jab at each other and tease <laughs> each other. But, but at the end of the day, you know, what, what is it um, that, that we're trying to share? What, what geeks us out on that kind of thing? So yeah, little, little role models out there. We, we, we talk about how like, yeah, you think, um, you think, uh, church can get toxic fans or toxic <laughs> members. Guess what? Just go to Comic Con, hang around Comic Con oh, for a little boy. while, and and listen to some of the conversations, and you'll is is no is no different. Um, so yeah, you you lifted this up, and I think it's an important too. Like we're talking about sci fi, we're talking about fantasy, Star Trek being sci fi, and its history of of Roddenberry being like kind of a futurist, um, more agnostic, kind of anti religion, but like hey, there's hope for humanity. Science is going to solve our problems. Uh, but then in Star Wars, this uh, save the princess in space, right. good versus evil, laser swords. Uh, wh- how would you define that? If someone's like, hey, what, what is the difference between franchises, but also like Asimov definition of sci-fi? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's why like one of the things when this topic came up, you know, I instantly thought I'm going to I've always thought with this so-called rivalry is that we're comparing apples to oranges because mm-hmm. really like Star Trek is true sci-fi in almost every definition of the word. Um, And Star Wars, while it may happen in space, it's really just Lord of the Rings in space. I mean, it really is. You know, it's just, (laughs) it is good. It is good versus evil. And, um, you know, they call it the force, but really it's just space magic. They're wizards in space. I mean, they they Mm -hmm. even wear robes, for God's sake. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. so uh, not that that's bad. I mean, fantasy is amazing and it is fantastic, um, but it it is its own thing and does something different than what sci-fi does. And um, yeah. the main difference is that so sci-fi usually the whole thing is built around some kind of scientific premise, usually. Um, you know, so for Star Trek, for instance, the catalyst of what helped unite 
um, unite humanity and create the Federation and all of that was the warp drive. You wouldn't mm. have Star Trek or any of that stuff if they hadn't invented um, that. Um, and then the other thing is just hmm. generally in sci-fi, um, what makes something science fi- science fiction and not just fiction um, is that it is based on existing scientific principles just expanded on it is to say hey what could this thing be in the future um and usually like star trek especially you can google well how does warp drive work and there's just a full technical whatever scientific explanation of how it could all work and all of that so what makes something science fiction is the science um Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I, I like that. Like the, um, that, cause when you ask, I, I love asking like real scientists, we have a lot around our congregation and, uh, since we're in the research triangle and they're Duke and UNC, mm-hmm. like we often have grad students and doctors in particle physics and PhD yeah. in particle physics and astrophysics and that kind of thing. So like when you ask them, like, what's your, which is your favorite kind of sci-fi They'll often say like Star Trek because it's more realistic. Mm-hmm. They'll say, yeah, yeah, I, I can't wrap my head around like the don't call Star Wars like realistic because you're right. It's fantasy in space. And so, yeah, some of these things just aren't capable of, of happening in space. But Star Trek, they at least try to acknowledge uh, there's some scientific uh, backing and speculation of what things could look like. And I think about our own world, like advances in, in technology and then here this kind of emergence of AI and what could be possible. Right. It could be scary, but it could also be helpful. And what if there are like conscious robots? here in 50 years from now you know it's like oh boy here comes you know data and data or or c3po or whatever you know like oh here we go you know what that that kind of thing and so what what leads that kind of sandbox that we play in and speculate against to help hopefully help us ask the question what it means to be human and our place in the universe is kind of what's behind these things but but yeah i i think i think you're absolutely right um and in that fantasy also gives us the the fantasy storytelling gives us an opportunity to then ask those existential questions of what is right or wrong uh how would i act in that situation if i am i hero am i villain those those kind of big questions revolve around fantasy but sci-fi is a different different way in a tool that it uses to get to those same kind of grand meta narratives that we just talked about um earlier so so yeah I, i think that distinction is 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 good there's similarities there they play off each other um but man i tell you um what, what would you rather? We'll talk about it later. Our bonus question: <laughs> what, what would you rather have? What would you rather have? <laughs> Phasing, beam me up, warp drive, or lightsabers and, and laser guns? Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll tease that later on. Uh, to, to do, <laughs> do that. Um, and uh, man, there's something I was going to say about you know in terms of um, the spirituality and magic of a fantasy. And thinking through that, it's not that science fiction doesn't have religion, mm-hmm. but it does. It does lean more into kind of the tension between the two rather than just kind of acknowledging uh, this all part of one world that maybe Star Wars or high fantasy would would do in terms of magic. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's transition here. If we're going to say, you know, what is what is the story or the morals or the myths that these franchises are trying to share? Um, what what would you say, Matthew? This is one thing we wanted to really kind of lift up that, yeah, there's not only fun popcorn fantasy. I'm excited about seeing all the special effects and how CGI works, but also <laughs> what is the story that it's trying to sell? What are, what was George Lucas trying to tell? What was Roddenberry trying to tell? Uh, and then what are these franchises trying to tell now? Before like fandom reacts because they didn't, you know, and I'm, I'm a part of that because they didn't portray a certain legacy character the right, right. way. What, what is the story trying mm-hmm. to say or communicate to us? Um, not necessarily an agenda, but what it, what is what is it trying to say? Well, Star Trek, um, you know, at least in um, it is almost singular in um, especially for that atomic era, almost all mm. almost all sci fi was dystopian. Mm. It, it, yeah, it was some always post some kind of, um, you know, event, event or, yeah. uh, you know, atomic, you know, whatever were. Um, and then like humanity had to, to not, had to unite to survive or whatever. Um, but, 
uh, Roddenberry doesn't have that, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a utopian future rather than a dystopian future. Um, and then that's, um, you know, that's all basically just, um, humanity was very much like it is right now. We invented warp drive, which got the attention of the Vulcans, which taught us we are not alone. Um, and then, so with that, we explored, uh, we explored the stars and we were able to create this really peaceful, peaceful, peaceful federation of coexistence just based on um, the fact that they can transport and just replicate matter and things like that. There's no more wars or poverty because resources are infinite. As long right. as they have the energy to create, they can just make stuff. <laughs> Um, you know, so that's, uh, yeah. And I guess they also have that prime directive too. Like they, eventually, like if there are other <laughs> civilizations who are behind, we're going to let them catch up to our scientifically advanced, uh, we're smarter than you, better than, not necessarily better than you, but maybe, I don't know. Like we're, we're going to let you catch up you, you guys who are behind and, and not meddle a little bit. So there's that prime directive, a part of that, like that futurism as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I really think, uh, you know, whereas Star Wars is supposedly at least a long, long time ago. So it's, yeah. you know, far, 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 away, far away. A long, long time um, ago. It, it's ancient. It's in the past right. of a of a more civilized time yeah. or a warring nation or a, a, a time when you could tap into mm-hmm. the magic mm-hmm. and spirituality of where yeah. Star Trek is moving years forward, yeah. where we're going to lean into the science, you know. Kind and of then back to the last question, I think that's more of uh, some of the differences between typical science fiction and fantasy is science fiction almost always exists or, or in our reality. Yeah. It's not supposed yeah. to be a different time or a different place or like a different universe or whatever. It is our, it is, you know, it, it is our world, our universe, our existence, just in the future. Whereas fantasy, mm-hmm. at least good fantasy world builds, you are yeah. in this, yeah. you're in this, mm-hmm. you are in this whole other place in this, nice. um, you know, that is far removed from our reality. So, um, that's, that's good. Yeah. And I think people say, George, you know, say what you want about George Lucas in terms of how he writes dialogue or how he directs actors and kind of the acting, not winning any Oscars anytime soon, but in terms of the word world building right. and the imagination behind it all and using the technology of the day or the special effects of the day to help communicate what this world looks mm-hmm. like and what it could be or, or that kind of thing that that's where he did. So I, you know, that's kind of my frustration there with Lucas there towards the end of the original uh, series and, and the prequels is not listening to the other storytelling. You've built this great world. Listen to other people on how you can tell a better story with the characters that you have right. kind of thing. Right. Um, so, so instead of like the yes men, yes women around them saying, this is what I'm going to do. How do, how do we let people, you know, the, uh, but I, but yeah, I, I can see where that's hard to do. You, it's your baby. You, you're going to sure. communicate what you want. So um, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I like this idea of star Trek of the explorer, the expanse of the stars mm-hmm. and who we encounter is going to teach us who we right. are and our place in the universe. Mm-hmm. And then I like that star Wars does have this kind of good versus evil, the morality and ethics of uh, what does it mean to, to love my neighbor or, or to um, the, the light side of the dark side of our existence. What, what wolf or Jedi or Sith are we going to feed more into our fear or our hope and, and love for, for the other. So I think taking care of the other. So that, that story um, uh, really speaks to me, especially this time in my life um, as a minister, shepherding mm-hmm. a community, thinking about the light side, the dark side, and what what are we going to feed? What are we going to lean into more or give more energy to? That that kind of thing, I think, is, is important in this day and age, uh, right along with that we're advancing scientifically mm-hmm. as fast as we can, yeah. rightfully or, or, or whatever, <laughs> or dangerously. Um, and, and, I, and I do think, have you, have you watched Three Body Problem or heard about Three Body Problem yet? Three Body Problem? Three body problem. Yeah. No. It's a, it's a book by Chinese author. Love the book. And then they made a, a, a show on Netflix and, um, pretty, uh, doing pretty well. And, and re- three bodies is like three, like, uh, three sons or, or orbital, um, 
bodies in space oh, yeah. that rotate around or other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so there is the unpredictable, uh, they're, they're unpredictable. There's chance, there's uh, random things that happen in right. the midst of all that. So the reason I, I bring that up is because like this, the premise is there, there are aliens heading our way. And so what do they attack? Um, they know they're going to get here in like a couple hundred years, 400 years. So what do they, they know that we're going to advance enough to where we can beat them by the time they get here. So what do they do? They attack our science. Uh, they try mm. to, they try to put our science to a halt. They try to, uh, break that down so we can't advance, um, uh, so we can beat them. So it's an interesting premise when it comes to that. But I think of that like Star Trek, like there's another different way to think about like where, where are you going to be a hundred years, thousand years from now? What's going to keep us being human? Or what makes us human, um, and I think that's what people wrestling with AI and robotics and those kinds of things. Right. Um, but then, um, but then, Star Wars, you know, reflecting back on on magic and fantasy and good versus evil and empire and systems that that can oppress. So, all all that's there, and all of it's fun, in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. There you go, folks. We could, man, I, I think I could talk about this uh, maybe until tonight, uh, midnight. We could have hours and hours uh, <laughs> oh, of, absolutely. Of, this, uh, of these things. And so, of course, we, um, we, we're not the final voice in all this and, and we're not hitting on every single theme. If there's a theme that we missed or something that we're missing and, or something that, that draws to mind uh, something that you have about these ideas, about these franchises, let us know. Uh, we'll, we'll keep talking about it. The, we're not going to stop talking about Star Wars and Star Trek. Let me just say, I'm stop. Um, so, so Matthew, like uh, in terms of we talked about it a little bit, but you know, is there a, a current or, or a favorite story or plot thread through the franchises, either one that you want to link to that that in the greater canon that that is your favorite that you're like, yeah, this is what really gets me going. When they start talking about this, when they start leaning into this aspect of this franchise or storyline, the greater canon, is there something that's like, yeah, that's why that's why I'm I'm saddling up with a with a bowl of popcorn. <laughs> Gosh, that's hard um, for yeah. Star Trek, especially. Um, I can definitely say, oh god, um, maybe not even with Star Wars <laughs> either. Yeah, uh, you know, there's, and maybe you know, maybe it's nostalgia, um, or 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 what have you, but mm. th- there's definitely there's definitely just something about that or- that original trilogy. Mm-hmm. In Star Wars, you know, the initial vision before, um, you know, other people got a hold of it and expanded it. Now, some of the expansion is good and it is better. I'm not I, I'm not saying that, but um, yeah, because yeah. It, anything that comes after, um, you know, at least in theory, if it's good, um, really just springs springs from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then. Um, I'm thinking here. Yeah. Well, while you're thinking, I'll, I'll just kind of echo that with Star Wars. I, there's some nostalgia about that original trilogy and why I get a little touchy about legacy characters and those things. Mm-hmm. But I think now, even with the Ahsoka series, mm-hmm. the thing that got me most um, excited is thinking about different ways to approach the force. Uh, that's not so binary, mm-hmm. uh, light and dark or or good or bad the, the gray jedi the the fall of the jedi order because it kind of got too like institutionalized right. and and turned in on itself and blind but then how is the force for everyone you know there there's still oppressive regimes and empire and people who want to uh, take advantage of of a universe like that or commodify it or or the lust for control and power but i think i think this kind of ancient idea of of the force and and who wields it or not and and how to use that to make um people better or the universe a better the galaxy a better place um it, that that's what i really lean into get into and 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 so that's why these these present i love mandalorian i love baby yoda uh <laughs> but but i want to know more like his his uh, approach to the force and where he's going to be as a Jedi. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I, I'm really looking forward to this Dawn of the Jedi movie. Like of all the things they've talked about in star Wars, I'd like, I like what they're doing. I'll, I will, you know, um, I'm, I'm not without my opinions on certain present day stuff, but man, I, that, when I hear about the plot line or what could happen with the Dawn of the Jedi way at the beginning of the first emergence of a Jedi and mm-hmm. how to use it first, I yeah. cannot wait. 
I cannot wait. And and I and I think because it's not connected to a legacy character, maybe we'll come in with less baggage mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, be a little bit more open to that. I know I will. Yeah. And so that's what I'm kind of looking forward to. And I I do like Star Trek, and I, I like the original cast. Um, I, I like um, the J.J. Abrams verse, you know. But but you know if they if they were going to put another Star Trek movie out in the theater, whoever's uh, directing it. Um, whether it's Quentin Tarantino or whether it's J.J. <laughs> Abrams or, or whatever, <laughs> or uh, Leonard Normoy comes back from the grave and, and directs another film, I would um, I'd be there, ready to go with yeah. that in mind. Um, yeah, uh, you know the Dawn of the Jedi sounds. Gosh, if it's good, it'll be yeah. like it'll be fan- um, yeah, it could be a game changer. Yeah, well, because I've I was always a fan of the Kotor games, so the yeah. the Knights mm-hmm. of the Old Republic. Um, yeah. And just get like getting to see the, you know, the Je- the Jedi Wars way back um, mm-hmm. was, was awesome. J- just filling in because uh, that's what's cool. Like, yes, it's a lot. These stories are a long, long time ago, but <laughs> just the reality that there's thousands of years of stories before the ones that we've gotten yeah. is cool. Um, yeah. Now is is there and and Star and Star Trek does that a little bit too, right? Like they you had the main cast, the original cast mm-hmm. from the sixties, uh, but they've gone back and and like the emergence of warp drive and leading up to sure. that cast. There's been other captains yeah. of the Enterprise before. Yeah. So, so there's some prequels there, and then there's some future, I guess, discoveries like the future of where it is now yeah. and that kind of thing. There's, they plan around with those timelines. There's too. two or three hundred years there between, you know, that and when with the initial story that we got. But even more than that, you know, if they wanted to go more alien with it, because mm-hmm. the, uh, you know, we know that the Vulcans had warp drive a couple hundred years before we did. And then there are even older, more ancient spacefaring civilizations that have been out there for thousands of years that they encounter. So um, <sighs> some people don't like the more alien centric story arcs in Star Trek. Mm-hmm. There is some contention there, but I have always loved the Klingon story arcs and the Vulcan story arcs. And some of the, some of the pieces where it pulls us a, a, a little bit out of being more human centric. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually exploring more about who and what um, these aliens are. And but even in that, you're still able to get the takeaway and ask, OK, well, what does this tell us about humanity? How does mm. this, you know, reflect on my, um, you know, my ethical standards and my, you know, religious or not religious beliefs as the case may be or whatever? Yeah. Could be by exploring something other than ourselves. <laughs> right. We're always able to use that as a mirror to reflect back on, okay, well, what is it about them that is other, that that speaks to maybe something that isn't in me that should be or could be? Yeah, that's great. Is there is there a particular book or or um, like show or something that leans into kind of like the Vulcan um, uh, idea or those kind of things? Uh, yeah, the alien uh, uh, yeah. so it's, um, uh, you know uh, – Enterprise is is hit or miss for people. Um, I am yeah. actually really a fan of it, but the the entire fourth season of Enterprise is Vulcan centric, and um, basically, nice. uh, the Vulcans be the Vulcans essentially at the end of that become more of they become the Vulcans that we're used to from the later series. Because, you know, while, Vulc- uh, while Vulcans are logical and um, supposedly uh, emotionless um, and all of this stuff, they also do have some kind of mysticism and spirituality, yeah. um, you know, because yeah. the the whole run of the movie, uh, the original series movies from two, three and four is really about Spock's soul, the the Vulcan, yeah. the Vulcan Katra. Um, so, um, that's really good. Um, and then I, some people don't, they think they're the worst episodes. I don't, um, any of the Klingon episodes in, um, the next generation really, uh, when Worf gets to explore his Klingon-ness 
or any of the episodes that happen on Kronos or are, or are more Klingon Empire centric, where we get to understand a little bit better their feudal system and their honor system and, uh, you know, what it what it is to be or not be a good Klingon and like, how does Klingon honor compare mm. to what we think of as honor? Are these compatible? Are we incompatible? What can we learn? I, I love that. Yeah, man. And good and good sci-fi and good storytelling helps us explore those questions. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. why we keep doing it. And we'll keep telling this story. I think what makes us human is the ability to uh, create and articulate story and meaning and purpose around it uh, to help us process uh, our lives and where we've been, where we are and where we're going. And so, um, yeah, I, I think where it runs in the problems and people have different opinions about, you know, how they should tell their stories of their favorite characters in the same way, you know, uh, you know, same way like if I gave a bad Christmas sermon about who Jesus is or isn't, people are going to complain like, wait a minute, that's not the Jesus I know. Like, so there's, there, there, there's, there's definitely criticism to come around that, that if you're going to just try to go off, off base and do your own fanfic on something, people are going to like, all right, uh, that doesn't really match up with the, the canon we, we have here. But I think when people huddle around uh, the kind of the campfires of, mm-hmm. of sci-fi, uh, they mm-hmm. know good storytelling when they hear it. I think the emergence of, of the next big thing for Star Wars episodic television with the Acolyte, you know, that the before the prequels and this emergence of, of the Sith, a couple hundred years, wherever it's set in the time frame, it's got a lot of lightsabers. I'm excited. High Republic era, <laughs> um, you know, blaze a lightsaber and I'm going to be sit up a little bit straighter in my seat. But I think, um, but then, but then you had the fans going, wait a minute. They, there's this one comment in the, in the Phantom Menace where they talk about, we haven't seen a Sith in a thousand years. And how come this is happening now? Did they not know? And I'm like, let them tell their story first before you start like <laughs> nitpicking canon and whether, you know, they're not going to lie with George Lucas's vision yet let let them tell their story first and then at the end listen to the whole thing first then you can go back and go well you know this sat with me this didn't sit with me right uh, we're allowed to have those those opinions but then um, you know the the dark side does cloud the Jedi's ability to sense too so 100 uh, percent just because <laughs> just because they haven't been aware of Sith for a thousand years doesn't mean there wasn't Sith I know. So. <laughs> I know. Exactly. I, that seems a little. It seems a little um, yeah. easy to see, but uh, I don't know. Maybe their 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 opinions are clouded by the dark side of toxic fandom as well. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? We've all been there. We've yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. This has been uh, super fun. Yeah. And so we're going to get into uh, a little now. We're gonna we're gonna wrap up here in a minute, but I I do want to share our bonus questions so yeah. for patrons out there um you know you get to hear our answer uh, when it comes to this but if you're not one a patron yet hop over just a few bucks to help us keep going and moving forward and and keeping our our enterprise and our big star cruiser moving forward through the universe uh fandom um we're gonna we're gonna ask the question and answer what would we would rather have be me up tech or lightsabers so there you go friends um thanks for listening we know there's a ton of options out there we know that um there there's so much that that you can consume when it comes to streaming and also uh when it comes to um uh, podcasts but but we're glad that we have a community here of, of hosts and friends and and listeners who who enjoy these conversations to help them think deeper about who they are and what's going on in the world and so uh thank you folks and may the four be with you always live long and prosper you (laughs) hey friends this is your pal will rose and i have some exciting news systematic ecology will return to Theology Beer Camp this year, October 17th through the 19th in Denver, Colorado. And we hope that you can join us. We are part of Theology Beer Camp in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, at my home church in my hometown. And that year, Theology Beer Camp was called The God Pods. And then we were in Missouri, a part of the Geek Stage. Yes, we had a whole entire Geek Stage where we had workshops and speakers and had incredible conversations. And uh, Theology Beer Camp last year was called The God Pods 
strike back. So you kind of see where this is going. Uh, and so this year, the theme is the return of the God Pods. And so if you head over to Eventbrite and follow God Pods 2024, or hop over to Instagram, follow it there. And if you enter promo code Geekshire, <laughs> you see what we did there? Yeah. Wilbo Baggins approves. If you enter Geekshire, all caps, no spaces, you'll get $25 off your ticket price. Geekshire, all caps, no spaces. G-E-E-K-S-H-I-R-E. Yeah, say it with me. Geekshire. Enter that. You get money off your ticket and you can join us and hang out and drink beer and have great food. And even if you don't drink beer, you can have uh, incredible uh, food and beverages and conversations with your favorite host here at Systematic Ecology. The geek stage is growing. I'm proud of that. And we thank Trip for this opportunity. We hope to see you at Theology Beer Camp, the return of the God Pods, 2024. Hi, uh, my name is TJ. I'm here to tell you about the Systematic Ecology Shop. That's where we post all of our merch. It is hosted on uh, Creator Spring, and we have a ton of really cool merch, uh, mostly clothing. We have hats, extra soft t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies, and more. Our hosts wear them all the time. It's actually super comfy. Uh, we have glassware, mugs, which everybody loves a good mug. Fill out your cupboard, get rid of some old ones, which is the part that I never do. That's why I have too many cups. Uh, we have cloth bags, posters, uh, and this, it's really stuff. We like to put our icons on there. We like to put quotes, uh, things we come up with. Uh, and it's cool. It's a cool way. And a lot of it is pretty subtle too, uh, to show support for one of your favorite shows. And my personal favorite is actually our SG dad cap, which I've, <laughs> I haven't been reluctant to buy it because now I have to wear hats at work and then I get tired of wearing hats, but it's really cool. It's really understated. It is our logo right here. And then it says systematic ecology on the back. It's great. It's a really good hat. We have a few of them floating around, uh, Check it out. And if we could all just rock the, the SG dad cap in public, I think that'd be pretty sweet.